Healthcare, and we are going to be talking about wheelchairs. So we wanted Vicki to join us today because she um, does a lot of training with CNAs. I'm going to let Vicki speak a little bit about what she does uh, with Facets Healthcare. Hi, thank you for hosting this video. My name is Vicki Castillo, and I am the founder and owner of Facets Healthcare Training. We are a CNA test prep, and we provide resources for CNAs to uh, pass their certification test. And we are in 19 states, and uh, I am uh, so honored that you have invited me to participate in this webinar because CNAs, uh, as we all know, use a lot of adaptive equipment and also specifically wheelchairs. And I thought that this uh, collaboration between the two of us would be a good refresher for them. And I know that even from us talking, I've just I've uh, learned things from your expertise that I think would be very valuable for CNAs and for anybody who uses a wheelchair or cares for another individual. Well, I appreciate that, and we are very happy to have you with us. Um, you know, caregivers, that is what we are a, a lot about. We are about, we are professional caregivers ourselves. Um, at Adaptive Equipment Corner, we um, provide informational and educational videos for those of you who haven't seen us before. Um, for caregivers, for people who want to improve their safety and function at home. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what we're all about, and I think this is going to be a, a great collaboration. Um, just for information sharing, because that's what we do. We do this for caregivers. So today, again, we're going to talk about wheelchairs. Um, the first thing that we want to talk about is just generally running through some of the different types of wheelchairs. We're going to just touch on those briefly. Um, initially, we'll talk a bit about um, a companion or a transport chair. Um, we're going to put a picture up here of what that looks like. So here is what a companion or a transport chair looks like. We're going to go through a few more of these and then we'll talk a little bit more in detail on the most popular or the most used types of chairs. So this is a companion or transport chair. The next type is a standard wheelchair. And this is the type you're going to see in a lot of facilities. Um, we're gonna pull that up here in just a minute. So here is a standard um, wheelchair. So you'll see a lot of these in facilities and some people have these in their homes as well. Um, we also have what you might see in a facility sometimes is a high back chair um, or a, often it, it reclines, it's a high back chair. Sometimes it's a tilting chair, but this is what that would look like as well. So you may see some of those in facilities, you may not. There's also bariatric wheelchairs. Um, that comes into play when you have an individual that may be a little bit uh, bigger that you need to accommodate in, in something other than a standard wheelchair. So you have a bariatric wheelchair. Mm -hmm. You also have pediatric wheelchairs that are, of course, uh, specific to children. So this is a type of a pediatric wheelchair. And usually those, um, you have specialized people that will take a look at those and me get measurements that are specific to the pediatric um, uh, individual. But let's take a look now um, at a little bit more detail on the companion wheelchair and the standard wheelchair. So the companion wheelchair, or transport chair, sometimes you might hear it called, um, some of the features of a transport chair, uh, first of all, it's lightweight. So it's going to be easier to put into and pull out of a, uh, a car. This is used um, for short durations. Maybe if you're going to take a loved one or a client out to the grocery store with you, out to a doctor's appointment. Um, so it's used for that. It will fold up. Um, the one thing that you need to pay attention to is this has smaller wheels, so it will not allow um, your loved one or your client to propel it um, themselves. So it has to be pushed from behind. Exactly. These wheelchairs also um, have brakes. They're on the back wheel, so the client will not be able to apply the brakes themselves. They'll have to have somebody with them to the, apply the brakes. Now, occasionally, like you see on this picture, you may even have um, hand brakes, like on a bicycle. So that's um, in this picture as well. Uh, these wheelchairs, these companion chairs, do have foot rests, and they typically swing away, so they, they can move out of the, the way when you're transferring your, in, your loved one in and out of this chair. 
So that is a little bit about a transport chair or a companion chair. So Celia, the transport chair, what I really like about it is that it's uh, so much more narrow than a typical wheelchair. So you can get it in and out of homes, especially um, entryways, doorways, whereas a standard one, you may not be able to. So these are, are more narrow. And so I really like that. I've used these quite a bit when I was doing uh, home care as a home care yes. nurse. So yes. this was very convenient for that. And of course, the lightweight part of it uh, is very convenient as well, because if someone is fragile or elderly, they still are able to push the wheelchair, but it's, it becomes a little more a little more difficult maybe to lift it in and out of the car. So this is ideal for that. Yes, absolutely. That is a very good point. The other thing I was going to point out mention, with you mentioning that is a lot of the, the companion and transport chairs, if you're going to get one, you need to pay attention to the specifications of how to determine what size because they size a little bit differently um, going by weight increments as well as some seat widths and seat depth. So, um, you know, take a look at that, especially if you're ordering it over the internet or something like that uh, to make sure that it's going to fit um, your loved one. Um, so next we'll talk a little bit about the standard wheelchair. And again, this is a more common wheelchair that you might see in your facilities. Um, it usually comes either with um, a foot rest or an elevating leg rest. This chair will fold up. Usually if you pull at the middle of the seat, it will fold right up um, with the arms coming together. Um, so this wheelchair has bigger wheels at the back side, so it will be able to be propelled by your client or loved one, or it can be pushed from behind. Um, I'm sure your your students see a lot of these, probably Vicki, in, in the facilities. This is probably the more typical type of chair. Yes, this is a more typical type of chair, and also uh, for patients that we, or residents that we want to be increasingly, or try to maintain their independence and they can yes. self-propel, these are ideal for that. and they. Uh, self-propel with their feet and of course with their hands as well so they're able to maintain at least some level of mobility which even a little bit is is helpful for, for, yes. for individuals very true and most of the time on these you'll have the leg rests that swing away you'll have the foot plates that will come up um, you know to, to be able to get those out of the way of the person that's transferring in and out of the chair um, and I say most of the time sometimes in the facilities it kind of depends on the chair and and the leg rests and uh, finding, you know, things that will, that will match up. But uh, most of the time those will, will uh, fold away and, and, uh, and, uh, or swing away and actually come off of the chair if you need them to. Right. Um, and I think that's a, a, a common, it's commonly overlooked that the armrests do come out and they pop up from the top. There's little tabs on the ends that you can press and then they'll pop up to yeah. make it easier to, for trans transfer purposes. Yes, absolutely, that's true. And usually, uh, typically, whenever you transfer somebody, um, you know, if, if they need a lot of assistance, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, but if they need a lot of assistance, you certainly do want to remove that arm in the direction they're going toward so that they don't have to be fully brought up into a stance position or have to clear that arm to come over into the seat that you're transferring them to. Um, so we usually try to remove the arm to give a little bit less uh, of an obstacle to bring them over in a, in a pivot transfer. Okay. Um, in the standard wheelchair, uh, the common seat size as far as, we, as, far as uh, seat width is 16 inches is usually considered a narrow adult wheelchair. 18 is typically the average. And then 20 inches in width, width is a little bit um, wider for the, for the little bit larger adult, but not, not that big of um, a difference, but the 18 inch is typically average. Um, the common seat depth in this chair is going to be around 16 inches. Um, so we'll talk in a few minutes a little bit more about um, trying to measure for the correct seat width and depth if you're looking for a specific chair, or if you're trying to figure out if your individual or your client will fit in that chair. Um, and, the, and the weight of the person has quite a bit to do with it as well. Yes, and these standard wheelchairs usually will go up to about 250 to 300 pounds. And now if you start getting above that, um, then you're probably looking more toward a bariatric chair. Okay. Um, but again, it just kind of depends on the specifications to the chair, but that's a general range for these standard wheelchairs. Okay. Um, now, the, 
we'll just touch briefly on the high back or uh, reclining chair um, because I know sometimes you'll see these in facilities. Um, so I wanted to touch just a little bit on that as well. Now with the high back chair, that is going to um, allow for um, greater trunk and head and neck support, especially when you have, you can see on this one, it has a head support that you can kind of conform um, to the person that's resting back in that chair. This allows for a change in position without having to actually get the client up out of the chair so you can recline it back. Um, it will open up the angle at the hip so that they're not sitting flexed all the time. So it just allows for a little bit of reclining and stretching of the hip mus uh, muscles so that they can recline back in that chair. Now, the only thing, sometimes with these, depending on where the back wheel is set, it may not be optimal for the person to propel themselves. Um, so it just kind of depends on the chair with that. Um, do you see many of these, Vicki, as I far as? I do some of these. I do some of these. Okay. And uh, I, uh, there are certain um, conditions which in which this chair is more ideal. So I'd like to just spend a couple of minutes talking about that. Um, I, I would say that probably uh, individuals that have quite a bit of limited physical mobility, I mean, considerable limited mobility, uh, for example, somebody who has had a considerable stroke. Um, right. I've also seen uh, individuals that are maybe quadriplegics uh, use these. They're more, they generally are probably better suited to use something that's more, um, specific for them for a quadriplegic um, or maybe even a paraplegic as well. Um, so those are the, I would say, indications for use of, of this. Or somebody okay. who has a condition as well that they have very limited upper body strength mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. and, or you anticipate they're going to spend quite a bit of time in a wheelchair and then that way you can help with their mobility or circulation by moving the, uh, the trunk rest up and down. Yes, yes, and I would agree with you on that. And it just allows for a better change in position. It allows uh, for some pressure relief. Um, the only thing sometimes with these chairs that you have to kind of take a look at is if someone is having a lot of difficulty um, with uh, pressure problems on their on their bottom. Um, if sometimes when they're reclined, they have a tendency to slide down in that chair a little bit. And that applies a little bit of sheer force on their bottom. Okay. Um, and when you have to pull them back up into that chair, it may add a little bit of a sheer force. So it just kind of depends on what their situation is. But yes, this is a very good chair for that. Changes in position, some pressure relief. And with somebody that's certainly not going to be quite as mobile as somebody that would be put in a standard wheelchair. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and typically on these, you'll find the elevating leg rests um, that allow them as they start to recline back that will allow them to, you know, lay out a little bit easier into a position that is more in, in a, a laying back or laid back position with their feet elevated and their legs elevated as well. Mm -hmm. um, so the other um, wheelchair that we want to just kind of tuck base on, because you may see this, um, a lot of times there may be a combination of this is the reclining uh, wheelchair as well as the tilt and space wheelchair. Um, sometimes uh, you might see this. Um, it has a combination of both. Actually, I know some of them more more um, recently or not no more recently, but uh, at, at this point in time are more a combination of both because I think they're finding that a lot of people need that difference in the tilt and space versus the recline. Um, as far as the tilt and space, if it's a true tilt and space wheelchair, then the angle um, of how you're sitting. So when you when you're in reclining in your chair, the angle of your hips and your back are not actually going to change. You're just going to be tilting back into the chair. So um, versus the uh, reclining chair where you actually change the angle at the hip. So the tilt and space is going to keep that angle at your at your. Um, at your hip, and um, it often can be used for if you have um, difficulty with spasticity, like ex extensor spasticity. So if you start to get back at all, um, there's some extensor spasticity that throws you into extension. A lot of times they'll use that tilt and space chair to reduce that, to keep that angle at the hip um, so that you're not leaning back. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's those are a little bit more specific to the person 
and they're usually typically fitted and, and uh, there's some uh, there's an assessment done uh, for that specifically for the individual. And, and I would also um, recommend that when using these this these very specific types of types of wheelchairs, all of them, but especially these that are have more moving parts and a little more complex, that always get the assistance of a physical therapist to um, to get information on how usability, the safe use of it, without the patient being in there. You right. Know, <laughs> without the patient being in there because you don't want to be messing with the functionality while the patient or the person is in the chair because right. that can be a safety issue. So yeah. always ask for help first to understand the functionality, test it out, see how it works with the professional being there to guide and to help to provide instruction. Um, because although every piece of equipment is a help, but it also can also cause injury as well. Yes, that is very good point. Very good point. Absolutely. And this Absolutely. wheelchair also can also help with hemodynamic balancing as well. And yes, yes, it um, can change if somebody's having low blood pressure, a low mm -hmm. blood pressure situation, or some other hemodynamic imbalance. So I know yes. that's very technical, but it's it's um, it. I know that nursing staff can help with that, or a professional can help with that. But that that would be a good idea for this. Yes, that's a good point. Very good point. Um, so now let's talk just a little bit um, about just some very basic measurements. Um, if you were trying to pick out, let's say, a standard wheelchair, most of them are, are like I said, going to be in a, a certain range of measurements. But if you're going to pick out a standard wheelchair and you're trying to figure out, is, is this going to work for my client or not? Um, a couple of basic measurements as far as the seat width. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be measuring at the widest point of their hips or thighs. Usually on, on females, it's going to be at their hips. Um, so the widest point of their hips. And then usually you want to add an, an, an additional inch if they're going to have any type of thick clothing or just for some movement in that chair. Um, as far as the seat depth, you're going to be measuring when they're seated from the back side of their buttock to the back side of the bend of the knee, okay? So you're going to take that measurement and then you wanna subtract a couple of inches from that because when they're sitting in the chair, you don't want the pressure of the back of the chair up against their, their leg. Right, so you right. subtract that a little bit so that they have a little bit of movement room there. Um, now, as, as far as the um, seat height, the front of the seat height, what you're going to do is measure them in a seated position with their feet flat on the floor, and you wanna measure them from the floor up to the back of the thigh, behind the bend of the knee to the back of the thigh. Now, you wanna take into consideration, is your client going to be self-propelling that wheelchair with their feet? Because if they are, then that's the measurement that you want. But if they're going to be using footrests, you need to add at least two inches because the foot rests are going to need to be up off the floor right. that, that amount of distance. So um, a couple of things just to take into consideration. Now, I know working in facilities in my past a uh, little bit, sometimes it's hard to find that specific of a chair for your individual. So some of the things that we try to do just kind of, kind of makeshift at times, but if they, uh, are a little bit short and you need to add something to take up some of the, the seat depth, maybe a cushion behind them so that they're not so far back in the chair so that their, their legs are um, appropriate um, as far as hanging off the front of the chair so that they're not getting that compression on the back of their legs. The other thing to consider is if they're going to be a spending a lot of time in the chair, may need to be looking at a cushion, some type of a seat cushion um, just for a little extra. Um, there. The other thing to consider too, or just to remember, is when you typically add a seat cushion, you're adding at least a couple of inches to that seat height. So, and I'm glad you talked about the height of the wheelchair. I know we spent quite a bit of time talking about the the, the width of the wheelchair, and, right. but I think it's important to also keep in mind that there's a difference in wheelchairs that we could provide a person who's six feet tall rather yes. than someone who's uh, four foot ten. There's, yes, there's that's, a huge difference. And do are they going to propel themselves or not propel themselves? So that's really important um, to right. keep in mind that it's not just the width of the wheelchair or the depth of it, but also the height of it. Because big, big difference there. Yes, that that makes the difference. And I, you know, time and time again, I've seen 
the the little ladies that they have a, a chair that's too too deep for them but they're self-propelling so they end up having to scoot you know scoot way down in their chair in order to reach the floor to propel and so they're sitting in a terrible posture trying to propel themselves um, around the facility so yeah something to definitely take a take a look at sure. as well um so vicky let's talk a little bit about some general safety precautions um whenever you're talking about wheelchairs, some of the things that I was thinking about is, you know, we need to, of course, always consider positioning um, and, and pressure relief. And that's where the cushions would come in, especially if the, the client's going to spend a lot of time in that chair. Um, you know, and depending on, on how the chair's fitting then that could be a, a cushion underneath their bottom and it could be a cushion behind their back, depending on how the chair is, is fitting. Um, the other thing I want to point out and kind of reiterate is always looking at, especially for those those caregivers at home, if you are looking for a wheelchair, especially a transport chair, make sure you're checking the the how you're determining what size you need mm -hmm. uh, for your loved one. Um, the other thing, you know, when you're using a chair, if you've tra if you've used a transport chair or if you've used a standard chair and it's been folded up before you put your client in that chair, you wanna make sure the seat is fully out in its full open position. If the back has uh, uh, comes up and down, you wanna make sure the back of the wheelchair is fully up and locked in its position before you would transfer a client into that chair. Right. Um, anything that you can think of, Vicki, um, you know, as far as when you wheel people, I know all the time, especially in homes, uh, where I'm typically at, I'm always saying, Keep your arms and hands inside the wheelchair when I'm pushing you uh, just because of elbows tend to get banged and knuckles can get scratched up a little bit if they're not keeping their hands and elbows inside the chair. Exactly. And I think it would be helpful if the a person also wore long sleeve shirts or a sweater, which they usually do because it, yeah. uh, they generally are cold. But it's a right. good idea because you just never know when someone might forget or whatnot. So I see that quite a bit where people just get injured from uh, their arms being out or their elbows being out uh, using a wheelchair. Also, all the wheelchairs are really handy for transportation. A person cannot be in there an indefinite period of time. Correct. They have to get out of them periodically for circulation purposes, as you mentioned also, for because a, a person is at risk for pressure ulcers when they are, or bed sores, for mm -hmm. sitting on, when sitting on a wheelchair as well. So as great as of a device that, as it is, a person needs to get up off of their wheelchair, lay, help them lay down, help them stand up. They need to, if they need to grab onto something, just to get up and move around, bear some weight, and just get the pressure off of those bony prominences, off the skin, of the tissue. Because anybody who needs a wheelchair generally is going to be at risk for skin breakdown. Yes. If the reason why they need a wheelchair, they're going to be at risk for skin breakdown. Yes, very true. Very true. And the other thing too that I find. Um, especially when I'm pushing somebody, I, I am just constantly telling, if they don't have footrests, so of course, if they have footrests, you want to make sure they're down and make sure their feet are on those, uh, the footrest before we start off. But if I'm pushing somebody without footrests, I am constantly, hold your feet up, hold your feet up, where are your feet? Um, you know, it's, it's very, you've got to be very vigilant about making sure that their feet aren't getting underneath the wheelchair. Right, uh, correct. You know, there's a lot of people, especially if somebody is a self-propelled wheelchair with their feet, um, they may be in the facility and may not have footrest available or anywhere close, and you may have to help them uh, at some point, you know, get them to point A from point A to point B. And yeah, in those situations, I, you know, I just can't stress enough the diligence about telling them, you know, keep your feet up and, can, and continuing to give those verbal cues and checking to make sure that's happening. So... Just and, for the, and for the most part, for general, for generally speaking, I think that most people should really have a cushion on their wheelchair, un unless they're just going to spend 10, 15 minutes on it. But for most, I think most of the time, I think there should be a cushion on there. As been the vulnerable population that I interact with or that I, I care for, I think that uh, well, the cushion is is ideal. Yes, I agree with you. I agree with you. And there's different types of cushions, but that's for another. That's for another yes. <laughs> video. That's right. That's right. Um, the other the other thing that I wanted to us to touch base on is a little bit about uh, transfers and transfer safety. Um, 
So, of course, I know you and I have talked about this before, and I know we agree on this, that we always want our client to do as much as possible. We want to let them do as much as possible. Exactly. Um, so if, we're, if that means giving them verbal cues or showing them what we want them to do or even taking a hand and placing it where it needs to be on the armrest to, when, before they get ready to push up or to, to stand up, um, that's something very important. And their feet um, should be positioned correctly as well, during yes. transfer as well, um, because you want to make sure that their feet are somewhere where they have as much support and able to bear weight as much as possible. So their feet should not be, you know, twisted behind them or you know, eight inches in front of them on their heels. So it, the feet need to be planted well and should be fully planted on the floor and uh, at least shoulder width apart. They shouldn't be together. Yes. 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 That's another thing. And not only should the patient or the individual uh, during a transfer, is it best for them to do as much for themselves, helps keep them independent, but it also is best for the care provider as well because they're yes. less at risk for injuring themselves if they're having not to bear as much weight or do as much manual labor and lifting and pulling in, at, at, on their own. Yes, I totally agree with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the other thing I was going to mention is um, in the wheelchair, or as far as the wheelchair goes, especially on the transport chair, the caregiver needs to make sure to apply the brakes. If they are in a standard chair, um, we can give them verbal cues, but we need to make sure as a caregiver that they are applying those brakes before they're getting out of that chair or getting into the chair. So the brakes are a big deal, always giving verbal cues on that. Um, the the uh, removal or swinging away of the footrest before they get up to make sure those are clear so that when they get up out of the chair, uh, the footrests are, are well out of the way. So those aren't in the way of the transfer. Um, Let's see. Oh, a couple other things that I know we wanted to mention. Um, you know, when we're transporting an individual, um, when we are taking somebody in a wheelchair, let's say we're going in and out of an elevator, we always need to make sure there's always, sometimes there's a mild difference between the levels in the floor that you're coming off of and in the elevator floor. So you always want to back that, back the wheelchair into the elevator and back the wheelchair out of the elevator so you're making sure you have control and you're not hitting that floor difference with, with the potential of your client coming out, of, falling out of the front of the wheelchair. If you hit something and it come, that chair comes to a stop. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, that's, that's the other thing too, the same thing is when you're, when you're pushing somebody um, on an uneven surface, you always need to be very cautious and aware of um, you know, changes in the terrain or changes in the sidewalk, um, just so you're not hitting something because it, it will stop a wheelchair. I've, I've seen it happen and it's kind of scary. Yes, <laughs> it's yes. amazing what it, it can do. So you always need to be very vigilant if you're pushing somebody uh, as to what surfaces you are on and, and if there's a change in surface when you Which do that. Direction, if you're going upwards or you're going downwards, you're going downhill or you're going up. So, yes. 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 Mm -hmm. um, and I know you and I had, had talked about this uh, before, Vicki, is when, when you're looking at taking somebody up and down a ramp, especially if there's any steepness to a ramp when they're in a wheelchair, you always need to turn that chair around backwards and use your body to slowly let that chair come down the ramp with you. If you try to take that forward, that person forward, first of all, you're trying to hold that wheelchair against their weight pulling down. And because of gravity, they have a tendency to go forward. So it's a potential of them falling, falling out of the chair. So that's something that we're, I'm always uh, talking about with my clients and making sure that if, if the incline is, is steep at all, you need to turn that chair around and back it down um, a, a ramp. Or something so, you, like that. so you want to use gravity in your favor. That is correct. Like yes. gravity. You want to have gravity work in your favor. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, the other thing, uh, I don't know, you know, as far as going up and down like a, cur a curve or something like that, I know some people will take a wheelchair down forward, but you have to be pretty proficient at actually tipping that wheelchair backwards and holding that client in that tipped backwards position. So I always recommend if I'm taking somebody up a curb, I will come forward. So I'll take the front wheels right up to the curb. And there's, there's little areas in the back of the wheelchair that you can put your foot on. It will tip it up slightly. I put the front wheels right up on the curb. 
and then you can lift the back wheels up onto that. Mm -hmm. um, I just find it safer. I don't, I don't know. Uh, it just depends on the person, but trying to tip somebody backwards and keep them in that position, that balanced position as you lower them down, um, I'd rather do it forwards. <laughs> and you do have to have a, a certain amount of strength to be able to do that. Yes. I mean, if, yes. you're, if the person that is pushing the wheelchair has really limited strength, they're very frail themselves, probably have maybe think about an alternative technique for getting the person where they want to go because you do right. have to have um, a good control of the situation. Right, right. You know, the other thing, too, um, that I know that we all know this, but I want to reiterate is we always have to tell our clients what we're doing. We always have to continue to keep them informed, um, especially if you're doing something like going up and down a ramp or going up and down a curb or changing what you're doing, turning them around backwards and pulling them into an elevator. I always like to keep them informed. It's, you know, it's the right thing to do and, and it helps them. Uh, you know, know what's going on. And so that we're not catching them off guard. Exactly. Exactly. So, the yeah. other, um, uh, uh, the other thing that I think I'd like to spend just a couple of minutes talking about, or just a, a just brief overview is I see some wheelchairs with uh, seat belts on them as well. Yes. Yes. So, and oh, what? Yeah. yeah they're, those vary. It just kind of depends on, I know some of the transport chairs, especially will have seat belts. Um, some of them you may find in the standard wheelchair, some of them you may not. Um, it just kind of depends on what chair you have. Um, if you have, uh, you know, it, it's always best if that's something that if you have any indication that there's a person that's going to slide out of that wheelchair, um, you know, during transport or something like that, it's always best to use that seat belt just to keep them back in the chair while they're in transport. Correct, correct. And then on, on that same note also, or similar note, um, sometimes a seatbelt in certain facilities can be seen as a restraint. So yes. we also have to keep that in mind as well, that we need to use it um, legally and uh, follow the policies and procedures of wherever it is that your facility is and that um, it's not being considered a restraint. So there's a lot right. to consider with the use of a, of a seatbelt, but uh, with proper application and thoughtfulness and you know, following policies and procedures, it would be appropriate in some populations, especially those who have very limited upper body strength, but we still want to be able to give them um, some mobility and, and some uh, diversion in, in their activities of daily living. Yes, yes, very true, very true. So Vicki, let's touch just a little bit on um, leg rest or foot rest. So that that is often used interchangeably, but Foot rests are um, typically the ones that don't have the calf pad. They're going to be, so we have a picture. Um, oh, let's get the, that other picture. This is, um, so a foot rest typically will come on a standard walker. You can get what we call a leg rest or an elevating leg rest as well. But here's your typical foot rest. Yes. So these typically will swing away. They will also, the foot plates will, will come up um, out of the way of the person if you need them to as well. Um, these will usually be set at a certain angle. Um, so, you know, they may be set a lot, a lot, most of the time for adults, they're not set at 90 degrees because the foot plate will be too close to the floor. So they're typically at, I think, 60 or 70 degrees of an angle so that when your feet are in a, in a wheelchair, they're not hitting the floor, um, or getting in the way. Um, so, but these are what we call foot rests. Um, and then we also have uh, the elevating leg rests, which are right here. So they look similar, but these will have calf pads, and then they will also elevate when you're sitting in a chair. Um, so that's, that's something else. Those don't always come standard. You may have to ask for those in addition or in, as a, a, something that is kind of an upgrade to a chair that if you're getting one for home, uh, you may have to actually ask for elevating uh, uh, leg rests as well. Um, the other thing to just keep in mind with elevating leg rests is, uh, you know, we oftentimes will use these if someone has lower uh, leg edema, lower extremity edema, we'll do a little bit of an elevation of the leg rest. We always need to be careful in how far we're elevating these. Yeah. Um, we may have clients that don't have very good knee range of motion mm -hmm. and it would be like putting them in a continuous hamstring stretch for you know two hours if we're if we're not careful right um 
So we need to kind of watch the range of motion um, and what's happening with that. The other thing that you will find is, is with the elevating leg rest, the, the um, adjustment for the length of them when they're in a, a seated position is going to be a little bit different than when you pull those leg rests up for elevation. So it's actually going to force their knees into a little bit of a bend because it's going to be a little bit short for them to lay out straight. So you may have to adjust the length of the leg rest mm. or if you have support between the two of them, sometimes there's a padded support you can put between the two of them to support both legs. You can actually pull the foot plates up out of the way and they would have a, a resting uh, position on the leg rest. That's a little bit, that's a little bit more detailed probably than what we need to get here. Um, but there are different padding systems that can go across both leg rests and support those legs without the foot rests underneath the, or the foot plates underneath the feet. Yes. And the, and the calf pads, those would be specific indications for that as well. Um, for most people probably would be okay to use, but remember there's specific indications for that where you would not want to use them. If somebody had a clot in the back of their calf, this would having that uh, calf pad would not be appropriate for that because it could put pressure on the clot and maybe dislodge the clot. Um, also keep in mind, it's important to keep in mind that a person should not have these uh, leg rests on indefinitely because it can cause stiffness of, of the ligaments the, the joints as well and can cause contractures. So again, always thinking um, that all these these apparatuses are good, this, this equipment have a, a value, but also they can, if not used appropriately, they can cause injury themselves as well. So extended use of, 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 a, of a leg rest can, uh, can cause permanent damage as well to an extremity. Yes, yes, so that's, that is very true and there's you know there's there's a lot of information there's a lot of information about wheelchairs um is there anything vicky that you can think of specifically um that you feel like we need to touch base on here as far as anything else with wheelchairs no uh, i think okay. we I think we we've done a pretty good job of covering it like i said i learned so much working with you and and preparing for this that i was uh um i thought the that the information we're going to share is going to be very valuable. Well, I appreciate that. And I, I have gained much knowledge from you as well. I appreciate working with you as well. Um, you know, uh, again, we want to reiterate the fact that you have, uh, you, you've got a great training site for CNAs, uh, for state testing. Um, we also want to reiterate that we have um, some care, a caregiver series that um, right now during this time will be, open and available for people to view. It does have information like this about wheelchairs, um, the, the basic features of them, uh, different types of caregiving activities uh, that may be useful to some of our viewers. Um, so that is open right now and we're going to uh, put a link uh, below after we finish this, this, uh, this video um, to how to access those videos as well. Vicki, you want to talk a little any more about uh, what you've got available on your site, or? Oh, sure. It's uh, videos as well. It's preparation for state the CNA's uh, test, uh, their certification test for nursing assistants who complete their certificate their um, program, and they can go in my site and purchase uh, for preparation purposes. But a lot of the schools are also using them as part of their curriculum and and part integrating it into their curriculum. So it's not just for preparation, but it's for instructional purposes as well, and. Um, feel free to give us a call if you have any questions on how it works. We do free trials and um, don't, don't allow um, your budget to say, well, we may not be able to afford it because we've been able to work out um, affordability with, with our clients and uh, we have payment options. We have st structuring that we can just about work with any type of budget. So what's important to me is that the, um, students, the schools have the resources that they need to help uh, prepare the next generation of care providers, and especially now that we know how valuable of a of, of, a, of a role our frontline healthcare providers are playing. Now it becomes, it, I think, what we recognize how important it is to make sure that they are, have all the resources to complete their training and get out there and start uh, working 
and um, helping out and and uh, providing patient care. So that's right. Yeah. That's right. I I totally agree with you, especially during this time. And so we we want to we want to help take care of caregivers across the board, whether that's professional caregivers, caregivers at home. Uh, there are a lot of caregivers that became caregivers overnight, not expecting it during this time. So yeah, uh, we can be here for them, and and that's that's why we're doing this. So family members taking care of family members, um, the patients, you know, neighbor taking care of them, or just uh, professional caregivers. So we care for individuals in many different roles in our lives. So we want to be a resource for you in whichever capacity we can, and uh, we plan on doing more of these videos and collaborating so stay tuned for the next ones that are that are coming up so um, um, just real quickly one thing we wanted to talk about i think is just the pediatric i think we need to just briefly touch on pediatric do you want to say anything briefly about pediatric wheelchairs well i think the the main point with a pediatric wheelchair is i always really specifically want um, you know i i don't do specialized seating and i think a lot of times with the pediatric wheelchair um, it involves a little bit more specialty seating, um, but we all need to know that those are certainly available and out there. Um, I don't know if you see many of many of those or have have, have dealt much with that. Uh, what I can say is for my geriatric population, my uh, senior population, oh, yeah. if they are very very underweight and very petite. We have gone to a pediatric wheelchair. So don't okay. think that pediatric wheelchairs are just for children. They can be used for an adult population if it applies the size, the weight applies, then we'll use it. And then the other question that I have is, are there different sizes of pediatric wheelchairs? I believe that is the case as well, that there are different yeah, sizes. I'm sure that there probably are some variations. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I typically, I usually defer that to the, our, our professional seating uh, therapist just because that's uh you know my mine is more toward the geriatric but I do like the, the fact that you pointed out that if we do have a smaller adult individual that is certainly something is certainly a resource to look into mm -hmm. as far as uh, sitting uh, finding some type of a seating for them mm -hmm. because that's very important mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then there's of course motorized wheelchairs as well so I know we didn't talk much about those but there are, mm -hmm. there are motorized as well and so perhaps we can just do a webinar just a, or a, a video just on the motorized big wheelchairs because I know there's a lot to those as well. Yes, so. yes, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. All right. Well, Vicki, we really appreciate you joining us uh, today on this uh, webinar, and um, we hope to do, and we are going to do, many more of these to come. So it was enjoyable to collaborate with you today. Um, have a good day to the, everybody from Adaptive Equipment Corner. Uh, we're going to sign off now and and uh, we will be back with you soon. Thank you, everybody. Have a good one.